All right, what I want to do is show you how to determine the implied domain of a function. So to determine what the implied domain of a function is, first thing we need to remember, you know, what exactly is the domain? Well, um, remember your domain is going to be your set of all your input uh, values or um, your independent values of it in a function. Remember, a function has independent and dependent values, and it also has your input and your output. Well, your implied domain is all the values of your input values, or what you call you know, input variable, which is x, that are going to be defined or make true your output value for y. So what we're saying is, you know, if I plug in a value for x, I need to be getting out a value for y. So you might be thinking, well, in a function, you know, normally in the functions, we knew that if I plugged in a number for x and I got two different numbers for my output, well, um, you know, that was, then it's not a function when I have two different values for my y. But, well, now what we're going to talk about is when is it when we plug in a value for x that I don't have a, a value for y. And there's two functions that we're going to be talking with today for this tutorial that I want to specialize in. The first one is y equals 1 over x. Now, if we look at the graph at y equals 1 over x, or if we just think of our you know, algebraic studies, what we notice is 1 equals y over x, we know that if I plug in a negative number all the way through a positive number, I'm always going to get a value for y except we know that x cannot equal 0. So therefore, the implied domain for this function is going to be all real numbers except for 0. So that's going to become very helpful when uh, we have any kind of rational expression. What we can do is we can find, rather than trying to find what are all the numbers that make our, uh, our domain true, what we can do is look for what are the numbers that are not going to make it true. Then the last one is we have y equals the square root of x. Now the graph for y equals the square root of x looks something like that. And what it means is I can take the square root of all positive values of x, but I cannot take the square root of any negative values of x. For instance, you know, the negative square root of 4. Well, you can't take any two num negative number or any two numbers to multiply to give you a negative 4 because a positive times a positive gives you a positive and a negative times a negative gives you a positive. So therefore, we cannot take the square root of a negative number. Now, how is this going to work when we're looking at regular equations? Well, I wrote down four of them that I'd like to go through with you, and then I'll give you a couple to take some practice. So the first one is f of x equals the square root of 25 minus x squared. So what that means is as long as what's you know, under my root is positive, I'm going to have a, a domain for it, which we call the implied domain. So what I'm going to say is, Whenever I have a number under the radical, I'm going to write it as 25 minus x squared has to be greater than or equal to 0. So all those values, for it to be in part of my implied domain, have to be greater than or equal to 0. Well, here, what I have is, I'll rewrite this as in, uh, let's see, simplify this as a difference of two squares, x plus x squared and 5 minus x squared, oops, I'm sorry, as x is greater than or equal to zero. And you know what we notice is now we have two test points. And my two test points, before I write them as x is greater than you know, zero or greater than negative five, what I have is um, I need to look at my two test points. And my two test points are going to be negative five and five. And what I do is by looking at my two test points, this one's negative five and five, I need to determine when is my, when are my values between these two test points going to make my equation true? So remember, any number that's going to make this negative is not going to be a part of my implied domain. So therefore, let's pick a number that's going to be less than negative 5 and see if it works. Let's pick negative 6. Negative 6 squared is 36. 25 minus 36 is not in a part of my implied domain. Let's pick 0. That's between negative 5 and 5. 0 squared is 0. 25 minus 0 is 25, so that works. Then let's pick a number outside of 5. Let's pick positive 6. Well, 6 squared is 36. 25 minus 6 is 36. Again, it's going to be a negative number. Therefore, I can say that the value of my function, or for my implied domain, has to be between negative 5 and 5. Any number greater than 5 or less than negative 5 is not going to be a part of my implied domain because it's going to make my root, uh, 
It's going to be my root negative, which you can't do. So to do, whenever you have any kind of problem with a root, make sure you set it equal to greater than or equal to zero, solve for it, use your test points to see, all right, which one of those are going to be true and which ones will be false. And then you can just go ahead and exclude the ones that will be false and just write your domain for all the numbers that are going to be true by using your test points. If I look at f of x equals 3x plus 4, a quick way to look at this one, I mean, we can look at our graph, but if you just think about what are the numbers I can plug in for x, negative 1,000 to negative 2 to 0 to 4 to 1 half to 99, and it doesn't matter what number I plug in for x, I'm always going to multiply by 3, add 4, it's going to give me a value outside of here. So therefore, the domain for this function is all real numbers, or negative infinity to infinity, but there's no number that has a restriction like these two functions. So this is all real numbers. For this problem, we do have a couple restrictions. We know that the bottom of my function cannot be zero. So what I want to do, remember, I don't want to find all the numbers that work for this one. I want to work backwards and find what are all the numbers that aren't going to work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, let's have zero equal x squared minus x minus six. So now what values for, for x make my bottom equal to zero? And whatever values I work with, I'm not going to include in my implied domain. So to solve for x, I'm going to have to use some factoring. So I have zero equals x uh, plus two, x minus three. Therefore now by using the zero product property, I can solve both of these and I can say x equals negative two, and x equals 3. Therefore, my domain for this function, implied domain, is going to be all real numbers except when x equals negative 2 and when x equals 3. Because if I plug in a negative 2 or a 3 into the bot into my function, I will have 0 on the bottom. So therefore, it's going to be all real numbers. So I can just write all real numbers except x cannot equal negative 2 and x cannot equal 3. For my last function, I have f of x, or keep on messing this up. f of x equals the absolute value of x plus 1. Again, let's just look at this as a theoretical without even thinking about the graph. What number do I plug in for x? Am I always going to get a value out for a y and, or your output? And you could say, well, yes, anytime you plug in a number into this function, it's just going to add 1 and then take the absolute value of it. Well, therefore, it's not going to have a restriction like the square root nor will have a restriction of uh, 1 over x. So therefore, this is all real numbers. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you guys three problems I'd like you to try to solve on your own, and then what I'll do is I'll come back and I'll show you the solutions to those problems. Okay, there you go, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let's work over here. What I'd like you to do now is write down these three equations. Um, give them your best shot. What I'll do is I'll come back and I'll show you some answers. Okay, ready. Here we go. Um, what I'd like to do is first, let's just kind of start with these and see how we do. Remember, we're trying to find the implied domain. There's two parts that, don't, that are not a part of our implied domain. Whenever we divide by zero, so whatever I'm going to look for, anytime I have a number that's going to be equal to zero on the bottom, that's not going to be a part of my implied domain, or anytime I'm going to have a number that's going to make my radical negative, my even root negative, is not going to be a part of my domain. So if I look at this first function, not even caring about anything else, am I dividing by any number that could be zero? No. Am I going to be taking the root of any number? No, right? This is just a simple quadratic function. So therefore, this, the domain, implied domain for this is all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity. However, in this function, I can have zero on the bottom. 
And when can zero be bottom? Well, let's solve for it. Let's set the bottom equal to zero. So y plus five equals zero. Well, if I solve for five, when y equals a negative five, my function is, um, is zero on the bottom. Therefore, it's not going to be defined when y equals negative five. Therefore, when I write my implied domain, I'm going to say this is all real numbers except for y cannot equal negative five. Um, now, in the last one, we've got to be very careful. I'm going to kind of work through this one. Uh, we can set it up two different ways. We could also say that you know, 0 equals the square root of x squared minus 9. And we could also say that the square root of x squared minus 9 has to be greater than or equal to 0. Is that still in there? OK, yeah, I got one. So, oh, I'm sorry. Just we just say whatever's inside the root has to be greater than or equal to zero. Right? Those are our two rules. We said whatever's on the bottom had, could not equal zero, so I set it equal to zero to see which, which values work. And then I say, all right, which on the bottom, which values are going to make this greater than or equal to zero? Well, to solve for this one, I square both sides, and therefore I get zero equals x squared minus 9. Add the 9 to both sides, take the root, x equals plus or minus 3. So that means whenever x is plus or minus 3, it's going to give me 0 on the bottom. So these two are not a part of our domain. Then let's look at it, um, then let's look at it, what other numbers are going to work that are going to make this negative? Well, if I solve again, And what I'll have is, if I have any number, now i got to look. I gotta, again, I have two test points. I have negative 3 and 3. So those are my two test points that I need to look at. Well, if a number is smaller than negative 3, is it going to make my root positive or negative? Or is it going to make my root, yeah, my, under my radical, positive or negative? Well, if I pick negative 4, negative 4 squared is 16. 16 minus 9 is 7, so it's still going to be positive. So that is okay. However, any number that's between... Um, negative 3 and 3 is not going to work, okay? Because let's say, let's pick the number 0. If I do 0 squared, 0 squared minus 9 is going to be a negative 9, which I cannot have under my radical. And any number greater than 3 would work. Any greater number than 3 would work. For instance, 4 squared minus 9 is, again, 16 minus 9 is 7. So therefore, my numbers can't equal positive 3, they can't equal negative 3, and they can't be in between negative 3 and 3. So what I'm going to say is my implied domain is going to be all numbers. x has to be all numbers less than negative 3. And it has to be all numbers that are greater than positive 3. So that is just one way. Like I said, you can write your uh, implied domain, guys. There's multiple other ways um, to do this. But I just wanted to kind of give you a quick little tutorial on how to determine the implied domain. I hope this helps. I hope you got a little practice. Thanks for watching.